was wonderful. It really was. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask our uh, pre-talk speaker for tonight, Diana, to come up and share with us something nice, just a nice message to warm us up, literally, and uh, figuratively as well. Good evening, everyone. Gosh, it's so cold today. Um, so today I just wanted to present a really short contemplation to you all, um, something that really blessed me um, before, and I hope it blesses you guys too. So we're just going to look at the story of Jacob and Esau, which is found in Genesis 25, verse 29 to 34. I don't know if we can get that on the screen. Um, and it's a story that many of us are familiar with. And we're just going to look at some deep message that you could take from this story um, and something that we can hopefully consistently remind ourselves of. So if we read from verse 25, sorry, from verse 29 to 34, we are told, Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold to him his birthright. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So as you can see, there are two brothers here. They're actually twins, in fact, Jacob and Esau. Now, Esau was a hunter, and Jacob was more what you can call like a mummy's boy, and he was cooking. And on this day, Esau came back from hunting, and he was just so hungry. And he was like, he sees this stew, and he's just like, I have to have this stew. Um, Esau said to Jacob, I'll give you my birthright for this stew. Now, basically, Esau sacrifices his long-term inheritance for his short-term appetite. As Christians, how often do we choose our own flesh over our faith? How often do we listen to the voice of others out there and we silence our own convictions because it's easier, it's quicker, and it would bring about faster results? And that's not the way of faith. And something, if I could challenge you, it's that know, to know that there is another way. We don't live based on our short-term results here or based on the results of right now or today. But we live for the seeds to be sown. So we live for the faith and not for the short term. It's so sad because so many of us here are so burnt out in our life, whether it's because of our jobs or because we keep chasing things in this life and things that don't even give us satisfaction or any self-worth or importance or we move from job to job just trying to find the next best thing or we go from relationship to relationship or different friendships just until we try to find what really, really pleases us or we look for the popularity, we look for the money, and that's really just playing the short-term game. And how many times have we spent maybe months or even years wanting something, and once we have it, it actually becomes like nothing to us. It becomes meaningless. The only thing we should be chasing after is Christ. And there is a saying that goes along something along, along the lines of, we are filled with this God-sized hole, and we are trying to fix it with man-sized solutions. But that doesn't work because... Man-sized solutions are not enough to fill us. A God-shaped hole is just so big that you can, nothing of this world can, fix, can pretty much fill it at all. And I once heard this sermon that once um, spoke about the curse that Adam was given. And something that really, really blessed me was that that curse is actually like a blessing in disguise because it left Adam with this emptiness inside of him that could only be filled if he came to God. That cre creation could explore the whole world. We see it with Solomon. We see it throughout the whole Bible. You can explore the whole world, but nothing is capable of satisfying anyone in this world. And the only thing that we are pretty much called to do, anything that we can really, really complete us and satisfy us is coming back to our Heavenly Father. And that's the only way we can ever achieve, achieve true satisfaction. Now, the world that we live in now, the society we live in, tries to promote moral relativism which is the idea of you do what is right for you and I'll do what is right for me. If it makes you happy, then do it. And that's pretty much telling us that we're in charge of our own moral standards. That moral is pretty much set to a really subjective matter. 
but that's not true because, you know, what's good for you might actually be harming someone else. And, you know, what's good for them might be harming you. So it doesn't even work that way. So that mentality is completely flawed. Now, the Bible and history tells us that when men is left to themselves, nothing good comes from it other than the wrath of God, which we bring upon ourselves when we choose to alienate ourselves from God. Now, God, he wants us for the long term. Through the eyes of Christ, we can see the unseen. And we should pray that God opens our spiritual eyes. That should be something we pray for every day. Because if we can see it, we can sow it. We're so focused on today. And, you know, we think to ourselves, YOLO, but we really only die once in this world. Those amazing moments that are experienced on earth, those circumstances where we compromise Christ for the sake of our daily pleasure, that is a non-believer's closest experience that they will get to heaven. Whereas for the believer, this is the closest we'll ever get to experience to hell. So when you think of all the depression, the anxiety, the betrayal, the hurt that you've experienced, that is the closest experience that a true Christian will ever experience to hell. And at the end of the day, just take comfort in knowing that this isn't our home. And I think that's something that like, I always take comfort in as well, just to know that we're not here for the long run. This isn't our home. One day we'll be on the throne with Christ. And the purpose of us here is that while we have breath in our lungs, while we are all existing on this earth, we all have a role to play. And this is all to build up God's kingdom. And I just hope I could encourage you guys with that today. Thank you. Um, I actually really like that thought, you know, you only die once. It's not only that you live once, you only die once. You have to die well. Um, okay, so uh, before we get on to the main talk, we're going to do a couple more things. So we'll start off with another hymn, and then after that, we will have a quick word about what it means to have to celebrate today and why is it that we're celebrating today. So, team. Father God, I wonder how I managed to exist without the knowledge of your fatherhood and your loving care. But now I am your child, I am adopted in your family, and I will never be alone. Cause Father God, you're there beside me I will sing your praises I will sing your praises I will sing your praises forevermore I will sing your praises I will Sing your praises, I will sing your praises forevermore. Only son, I wonder how I manage to survive without the knowledge of your sacrifice and humility. But now I am your friend, I have awoken to your call for me, and I will never lead you, Lord, cause Jesus Christ, you're the Almighty, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises, I will. Sing your praises forevermore. I will sing your praises. I will sing your praises. I will sing your praises forevermore. Holy Spirit, wonder how I managed to enjoy 
without your comfort and your gentleness and authority. But now I am your temple, I must like to all those who see me, and I will never feel empty. Holy Spirit, you sanctify me, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises. Forevermore, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises forevermore. Cottage Church, I wonder how I managed to succeed without the knowledge of your strength and faith and your history but now i know your beauty i'm a member of the one body and i will never be worried because coptic church you liberate me i will sing your praises i will Sing your praises, I will sing your praises forevermore. I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises forevermore. Okay, so um, just before we bring up our main speaker tonight, um, we'll have uh, Joseph Hanna come up and say a few words about what's so special about today. How you going, everyone? Um, I've literally just been put on the spot for this. I've got nothing prepared. Um, can actually, can you put up the last slide of that? of that hymn. So the feast today that the church celebrates is the Lord's entry into Egypt. And we all know the story, it's in the gospel, Christ enters Egypt, um, fleeing from Herod because Herod wants to kill him. Um, and obviously when Christ came, blessed all of Egypt, the only country that he sort of visited outside of Israel slash Palestine, whatever you want to call it. Um, but what's important for us, you know, we're Coptic, Orthodox, but also which means Egyptian Orthodox. So this is sort of a big feast for us in terms of our heritage, in terms of our culture, in terms of everything sort of that we grow, like it's how we've grown up. We've grown up as Egyptian, we've grown up as in the church. But what I like about this sort of last verse of the hymn is sort of we're saying the church, I wonder how you succeed without the knowledge, the strength, the faith, and your history. We're going to sing your praises. Um, I'm a member of this, of this one body, this church. You liberate me. I, I won't worry. But now I know your beauty. Do we actually know the beauty of our church? Do we know the beauty of our history? Do we know the beauty of our culture? And I feel like sometimes we sort of, this is me personally, I don't know about you, but we look outside, people with other cultures, they're so proud, they're so patriotic about their culture, um, and they'll speak it to the ends of the world. But us as Egyptians, us as cops, we tend to, we're, we tend to be embarrassed of our Egyptian culture. We don't, we don't say, hey, I'm Egyptian. This is what it means to be Egyptian. Um, this is what it means to be Coptic. We tend to sort of say, you know, yeah, it's, I, I don't associate myself with I'm Australian, but I don't associate myself really with that Egyptian culture. So I just wanted sort of to leave, leave you with a message that let's sort of try and break that, you know, thought process. Let's be proud of our culture. Let's be proud of our Egyptian heritage. Let's be proud of our church, you know, where we're sort of standing in a place where people literally died for, you know, from the first century up until a month ago. 
people are still dying for the fact that they're not just Christians, but Coptic. So let's just sort of work on me, me as well, being proud of being Egyptian, being Coptic, and sort of let's show the world virtue what our culture is. And that's the purpose of this Global Coptic Day. So the church has, um, for the last three years, the 1st of June, which is this feast falls on every year, the 1st of June, they've called it Global Coptic Day as a way of promoting the Coptic culture to the rest of the world. So let's try and, and do that today. Strong words, wise words, all of the above. Okay, so without further ado, I will now ask our speaker for tonight, um, Mr. Shahir Gobran. I'm bringing up that last name because he's uh, a very important person related to Abu Nishnuti. If you don't know, Abu Nishnuti's last name is Gobran as well. And so uh, you can expect a really knockout talk today. He'll be talking to us tonight about how knowing God is the narrower path which is true, but I'm, I'm really interested to know why. So without further ado, Anka, please. Um, actually, I, um, somebody said um, that Diana was the warm-up. I, I think I should be the warm-up for Diana. I loved your words. Amazing. So thank you very much for that. And uh, it's actually fairly much on the same theme that um, we basically have a choice and um, nothing good ever happens in our comfort zone, right? Nothing uh, like this, um, one of the words that Diana mentioned was we have a God-sized hole that we try to stuff it with man-sized solutions and it just doesn't fill the hole that we have. So this is a really good introduction to this topic. Now, let's start by reading a, um, the actual verse that talks about the narrow way and the narrow gate, and that's found in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. So if somebody can uh, click to be there. Very good. So it, uh, it goes, uh, it's probably better to read the same translation. I might have a different one here. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So this is uh, the... The, the verse that sort of generates today's talk. So Jesus here talks about a narrow gate and a narrow road, right? So picture this, like if you just see it in your mind's eye, that there's a, you, you're in this place and then there's a narrow gate and a broad gate. Now, generally speaking, you know, if, if there's a, a nice broad gate and nicely decorated and huge and looking very attractive, we're all drawn towards it. Whereas the narrow gate is something we probably wouldn't even consider. And that is why Jesus said that we are the little flock. We're not the majority. We'll never be. Some people say, oh, there's 2.2 billion Christians. Well, that may be in just numbers or name. But the reality is, Jesus said, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and I says, I don't know you. So what's the secret? It's because they didn't go through the narrow gate. You might have the badge of being Christian. You might have a Christian name. But, let's not say you, if a person, right, then doesn't follow the narrow gate and the narrow road. Well, Jesus was very clear about that. The other way, the broad way, leads to destruction. So just picture this, the two gates, a narrow gate and a broad gate. 
Uh, fathers mentioned uh, one of the meanings of the narrow gate. Uh, there's a very important meaning, which I'll leave right to the end, but the, one of the meanings that the fathers contemplated on is baptism. So the narrow gate is baptism. Why is it the narrow gate? The narrow gate is... Uh, because baptism is a narrow gate because in baptism we symbolically die. Right? It's a symbolic death. And a resurrection, of course. But it starts with a death. Right? So it is, it is a narrow gate through which we, we go from death to life, which is symbolic of our own lives. We are in this, in this world... We are walking in the road towards death, to our physical death. But there is a resurrection. Our hope is in the resurrection. Is that whoever said it before, you only die once. Well, unfortunately, some people will die twice. And that's what the Bible says. Do we know about that? Who, who can tell me about this? About that? Oh, okay. Well, somebody should remember then. <laughs> if I want to get... <laughs> All right, well, you can tell us that if you heard of Buddha. <laughs> so what is that second death I'm talking about? <laughs> you brought it on to yourself. <laughs> okay, so what is that second? That's right. So we are, you know, blessed is a person who will not seize the second death. So that's our aim. Our aim is to only have one death, right? But unfortunately, there are a majority of people will go through a second death, and that is being cast out into that eternal darkness, which was prepared not for us. It was not prepared for us. It was prepared for Satan. But because there are people who will follow Satan, they will end up with him. Right. So, so the first gate, the narrow gate, the first meaning of a narrow gate is is the baptism. But what happens in baptism? We are born of the water and the spirit. So we become spiritual beings. There's a change. And by the way, you know, Jesus said many are called but few are chosen. So you, you know, consider yourself one of these very few people who are called and chosen. Consider yourself as a very, very blessed person. One of our priests, our dear priests, Abuna Bishoy Yassa in Abu Safin, used to always say this, consider that you are born with a silver spoon in your mouth. You're born royal, if you like, right? Because you did not have to, you know, go run far or go far to have this, to have all this, to have all this, um, the, the birth from the Spirit, being called and chosen to the kingdom. This is an incredible, incredible privilege we have. And in our church, we have people who have come from far away to be there as well. Like one of my dear friends was a Muslim before. And, you know, what he had to suffer to what he had to go through to come to the kingdom was incredible. So we are very, very blessed. And so, but also with that blessing comes a responsibility and accountability. So we are accountable. So if we baptized, if we carry a Christian or Coptic name, whatever, well, we are accountable. We don't just stop there. Okay, well, it's like a magic formula for me to go to be with Christ. No, I have to strive through the narrow gate. So let's talk about that a bit more. So once we go through this narrow gate, what happens? We are baptized. What happens next? Okay, we grow up, of course, and then after we grow up, even during the growing up, we are constantly faced with choices. There is a narrow road, and a broad road. So you've entered through the narrow gate, but then there's the two roads as well. We always have a choice. I have a choice whether to pray 
or to do something else. I have a, pray, a choice between doing the good things or doing bad things, being kind and being selfish. Uh, chasing my desires or com committing myself to Christ. There's always a choice. So that choice between the two rows doesn't happen once and for all. It happens every minute of every day. We really need to be awake to that. Even in a point when I receive a phone call and it's really something that's very annoying and I allow myself to shout and, and sort of get really angry and abuse somebody, there's a choice. Or if I'm driving and somebody cuts in in front of me, there's a choice. I can get angry and do all sorts of things, you know, or I could have a different choice. There's always a choice. We always have a choice between the narrow road, which is difficult, and the broad, which most people head into. So that is my responsibility, to keep choosing. So if you um, look at the life of a, a fashion model, for instance, right? You may not think about it very much, but you know you might feel like going to Macca's and you know have, have this and have that. But a fashion model with a show tomorrow, like, has to sort of control every gram of her body weight. Or an athlete going for the Olympics, which it doesn't look like it's going on, but anyway, you know they have to practice every day. And imagine somebody says, "Oh, I don't feel like going to," you know, my um, my practice, and they show up, and they're just going to be a laughing stock. They're not going to perform to their best. They're going to fail. So people who take a particular vocation in life, like modeling or being an athlete, they take their life very seriously. So every time they have a thought, oh, I should go to Macca's, no, they, they say no. I'm just giving an example. I'm not saying Macca's is bad. <laughs> you can see it probably had a few before in my life. But um, no, I'm not making this particular, but other, other things that I shouldn't be having. But anyway, um, look, it's not about, it's just an example that when people take something seriously, like every moment, every choice counts. So you, you, th th that's really for us as a good example to emulate. Um, so let's read a verse which, um, which should really put this meaning a bit deeper for, uh, like make this meaning a bit deeper for us. So if we go to Romans 8, 5 and 6. I'm very impressed how quick this comes up on the screen. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So it's a very clear choice. Spiritually minded, carnally minded. Spiritually minded, narrow road. Carnally minded, broad. It's a continuous choice. It's a moment by moment choice. And all we have to be, all I have to do is be aware of that. Just be present to that. Be aware at all times. Am I going left or am I going right? Which is the better choice for me? Am I walking the way of death or am I walking the, day of, the way of life? Very simple choice. So some people might say, well, why does God have to make it so hard? <laughs> why does God make it, you know, is God just, you know, wanting to, us to suffer and squirm, you know, uh, asking us to go through a narrow gate and difficult gate and, and difficult, difficult road, I should say. Okay. Well, we... Uh, it's a very simplistic, actually. It's a very, not, not even simplistic. It's a, 
It's a very evil way of looking at it, actually, that question. Um, and we'll, we'll get to understand why in a minute. So to understand it, let's just go back to the beginning. We know that Adam had a very simple choice in the garden, right? One commandment and one commandment only. Do not eat of that tree over there. And what did he do? He ate of that tree over there. <laughs> so he and his wife, well, she started and gave it to him and he was blaming her and you know, all of that stuff, right? So it's not a simple thing. It is basically what, what it was that Adam chose the way of death over life because God made it very clear. If you eat it, you'll die. That's the road of death. Right? And he had life. God doesn't make beings that die. So there was a plan for God was to actually Adam to live forever. And Adam was going to live in the garden for some time and then be taken to live forever. That was the plan. But he decided, no, I will walk the other way. And, and that's when, all, when it all started. Right? So from that moment, we are living in a world when Jesus himself said that the ruler of this world is not God. Who's the ruler of this world? Satan. Like we elected him ruler, right? It's like there was an election. Adam had an election. Said, so you elect God or you, who do you want to follow? God or Satan? Said, so no, I'll, I'll pick Satan. He sounds a lot better. And from that time on, Satan is in power, right? He was elected by us. And therefore, it is incumbent on us to change the election, to change the result. So to keep electing God, to keep making that choice, to keep making that conscious choice to go the narrow way rather than the broad way of this world that is ruled by Satan. That's why it's a lot easier because that's the tide. That is the current. Go with the flow. The flow is Satan because he is the ruler of this world. But you are asked to swim against the current, not because God wants to kill you or make you tired or watch you squirm. It's because the only way to safety is against the current. It's not with the tide. It's not with the flow. The flow leads to death. So it's your responsibility, if you want to live, to swim against the tide. Not because God is a sadist. Absolutely not. But the Im amazing thing is this. I think Diana said something about it. I can't remember the exact words you used, Diana, but it was about the emptiness that is found in that broad road, right? What did you say? Do you want to repeat some of the beautiful words you said earlier? <laughs> I think it's about um, how the, the, the broad way, leads, like there was depression, and uh, you mentioned something like that. I was going to mention it too. Is it, is it? Oh, it's depression and... Yeah, yeah, you, that, that's the bit. Yeah, that's the bit. Good memory, much better than mine. <laughs> Sorry, what's your name? Leanne. Thanks, Leanne. Do you, do you have that bit there? Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Let me know if this is the right, what you're talking about, but it's about, like, how Earth is the closest experience a true Christian will ever have to um, hell, pretty much. Like, all the betrayal, the depression that we go through here on Earth, mm. as hard as it is mm -hmm. for us as Christians, that's, the, like, the closest we'll experience to hell. But, you know, for those who are non-believers... Mm -hmm the satisfaction they get now from this earth, that's the closest they'll ever experience to heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to say it in a different way, but that's beautiful. I wanted to say it in a different way, that just examine this, that people who are really like the celebrities, for instance, right? Celebrities that the whole world follows and whatever else, you know? These, these people, look at their lives, 
You know, how many of them are addicted to drugs, alcohol? How many of them have committed suicide? How many of them have this emptiness? And you think, on the surface of it, these guys have so much money, so much fame, so much power, they can do whatever they want. But you look at people who are very, very simple and very poor, you find some kind of, there's no emptiness, that they just basically survive. You know, the suicide rate, for instance, in, in affluent countries like Australia, amongst the, the youth, right, is incredibly high. But you don't get that in poorer countries, amongst poorer people. Not because poverty is good and richness is bad, no, but the broad way, that the more broad your way, the more available everything is to you, the more empty you become. It's like a, a, a dichotomy, like so it's, it's quite ironic. Whereas when you really have to um, work hard to survive, you're busy with the stuff of life that you don't have that emptiness. But that's not quite the narrow road that we're talking about, but it, it's kind of a, a parallel to that. So when we are carrying a cross, so, you know, you open that gate, we, as we said, the narrow gate, and the first thing you do, Jesus says to you, carry your carry cross and follow me, follow me. So not only are you going through a narrow road, you're also carrying a bit of a cross, right? And that cross, you know, it sounds like something nobody wants to do. But the reality is, the broad way with all the stuff, all the money, all of that, leads to complete emptiness, to depression, to drug addictions, to all sorts of terrible things. Whereas, if you really carry your cross, you have joy in this life. I'm not talking about the life to come yet. That is obvious, because we said one leads to death and the other leads to life. But even in this life, there's a lot of joy. Let's talk about that a bit. Um, in, um, because Jesus himself didn't ask us to carry the cross without carrying it himself. And let's read a, a beautiful verse from Hebrews 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 2. Says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus is our, is our prototype. He carried the cross literally. Right? He left the glory of heavens and chose to come and be born in this, you know, in a very difficult circumstance. Like today we're celebrating the day he escaped from death to go to Egypt to, to you know, so that he would not be killed, even as a baby. So from the time he was a baby, he was carrying a cross. You know, there was a, a desire for, the, for, for Herod to kill him even as a baby. And so, he, he, for the joy that is set before him, he carried this cross. He lived, uh, when those three years before the cross, he, he lived like a homeless person. Didn't have a place to lay his head. Didn't have a home, didn't have money, didn't have possessions, didn't have anything. He, he actually was, you know how Jesus actually was being fed by donations. People were donating money to him. So he chose that. He carried that cross for us to give us an example. So this verse says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. What is that joy? So what was the joy in him carrying this cross and doing what he did? What was that joy? Can anybody tell me? What is that joy? Come on, somebody should answer this. 
What joy in all this? <laughs> Come on, Mary, you know. Tell me. What was the joy for Jesus? What, what, what did he get out of it? Salvation for us. Yeah, he saved you and saved me and saved everyone, right? That's the joy. He wants you to live. He loves you to the point that he goes through all this so you and you and you and you and me can live. Right? That's, that's the joy set before him. He had to escape as a baby out of his country. And he had to live like a homeless person and not to mention all the pains, of the passion of, of, of the last day on earth through five judgments and floggings and the cross and carrying the cross first and then the nails and the cross and the crown of thorns. All of that for the joy. What is that joy? You. You are saved. You are alive with him. He wants to bring you from death to life. And all you have to do is to look unto him. Look unto him. So, How much time do I have? Another five minutes? No, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> well, how, long, how long do I have? Five minutes? A bit longer? No. <laughs> okay. So, so we know what is at the end of the two roads. We, we said there's two roads, the broad one, which leads to destruction, death, huh? and the narrow one leads to life, right? Is that hard? Why is nobody answering? Am I talking to myself? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So, but the, the actual talk today was that the narrow gate is God. Yes, the narrow gate is God, is Christ. But why is it narrow? One of the fathers said a beautiful contemplation. He said, to be in Christ, who is a narrow gate, I can't be puffed up. I need to be humble right, in order to enter. Now, why? Why do I have to be humble? In fact, I should be proud, you know, he came to save me, but... No, but I need to be humble because, in fact, again, I wouldn't show you, I'll quote him, and it's a beautiful quote too. He says, it's a misnomer to say that I can be humble because something very low can't go lower. We are very low. As a human being, we are, <laughs> he says, I'm an insect. He, call, he calls himself an insect. Hashara, <laughs> says in Arabic. So in other words, like, I need to know my place, Right? You know, from this whole universe that God created, we live on this little speck called Earth and we're very small people. But the amazing thing is that he loves us. This is the most amazing thing. But we are so small that despite that, sometimes we can be puffed up. We can depend on our own minds, our own abilities, et cetera, et cetera, and have no place for him in our lives. So we can't enter the narrow gate unless I empty all that and realize how much I need him and realize that without him, I'm nothing. Without him, I'm dead. Without him, I'm going through the second death. That I need to really know my place in order to be in him. And again, when we take up his yoke, take up this cross, it is not again, it is not because he wants us to be burdened, but something amazing happens when we take his yoke. Let's read um, what he said about that in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 30.
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when we take up the cross, there's a lightness that comes with the cross. So it's like, again a dichotomy, a sort of, you know, it's about opposites in the same time, in the same sentence. My yoke is light, and my burden is easy, or the other way around. Yeah, my yoke is easy, sorry. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light, right? So, so that you see that in the same sentence, the two opposites. But why do you think that is? Why is he saying my yoke is light or easy? My yoke is easy. I've got to go right in my head. My yoke is easy. Why is it easy? Burden is light. Come on, why is everybody afraid to say anything? Yes, please, Paul. Uh, I can't hear that well from this distance. Because of grace. Thank you. So say a bit more about that. What, what do you mean grace? The grace of? Yeah, that's, that's correct what you're saying, but I just want you to expand on it a bit. Thanks, Paul. Uh, you know the narrow gate, right? We, yeah. We humble ourselves. Yes. And we take on the challenge of ourselves. Yes. And that actually emancipates us from a lot of the things that burden us. Yeah. And so when we look uh, up towards God rather than the self, Grace comes easy, and so we get lifted up, and it Very becomes good. light. So that yeah. grace comes when we humble ourselves, but we actually get lifted so much higher. Yeah, because again, he loves us. He gives us his grace. He carries the cross with us. I remember one point in my life, I was going through a very difficult time. And I was sitting with one of our priests, and I said, um, Father, the, the cross is very heavy. And he says to me, Ah. Oh, you don't feel the heaviness of the cross all the time, do you? I said, mm, sometimes, yeah, sometimes, no. He says, yeah, well, the times when you feel the heaviness of the cross, the Lord allows that heaviness to come so you know that other times he's actually carrying that cross for you. Remember this footsteps in the sand? There was a, yeah, most people know about this, so the footsteps in the sand. The times when you see only one set of footsteps are the times when the Lord was carrying us. It's the same meaning. So that's the grace we're talking about, when he carries us with his grace, when he takes away the heaviness of the cross. And the more we depend on him, the lighter the cross becomes. The more we depend on ourselves and our strength and our mind and our ways, we will feel the weight of the cross. So we're not meant to carry the cross alone. I love this story that somebody once said, in Egypt, I don't know if some of you may not know what I'm talking about, but in Fallahin, you know, like the, the very poor farmers, the women usually carry a big, heavy jar on their heads. So this story goes like one time this guy was driving a beautiful convertible car, Cadillac or whatever, and then he saw this really old woman carrying a very heavy jar and kind of really suffering under that weight. So I felt sorry for her. I said, lady, come in, come in. I'll take you further up the road. So she got in, and she kept the jar on her head. And he said to her, well, you know, you're in the car now. You can lower your jar, put it in, on the car. He said, why would you carry me and the jar at the same time? Do you get the, the meaning of that? She didn't want, like she felt burdening him if she took the jar down and put it in the car because he would be carrying her and the jar. But she wanted to carry the jar on her head while she's in the car. Do you get the, the picture? It's, a, it's a, like a parable. It's not a true story. But the idea is, the idea is that w the grace is like that car, right? And the Lord says, come, you know, be comfortable. I'll comfort you. But I still want to carry my burden even though he wants to carry me. So we need to learn to allow 
him to carry us and our burdens, to leave all our burdens to him. That's a great learning. And when that happens, that is when you experience grace, the grace of God in its fullest. So I think it's 9 o'clock. I think that's more than enough, right? So um, just to conclude, I would say there's the one sentence that he is the narrow gate. Um, and the, the, the road is, that he chose for us is that narrow road. But you need to know that despite its narrowness and despite the fact that you have to carry your cross while you're walking on that narrow road, that he will give you lots of joy. Ask anybody who chose the narrow road, like the saints, right? Saint Mina, for instance. He had an opportunity, he had a choice, broad or narrow. Broad, he could have stayed in the army, he could have been a great general, lots of money, you know, beautiful wife, kids, whatever he wanted, beautiful house, anything he wanted, right? But no, he chose Christ. He chose to renounce all that to be with Christ. Any of the other saints who had a similar experience, like St. Damiana, St. George, so many of them, who gave their life through the narrow road. Okay, that might be too high. Let's go another, another level. The level of people who take in monasticism, right? Again, they could have had this and that and the other thing in the world, in the narrow, in the, sorry, the broad, broad road, but they've taken the narrow road of monasticism. Or in any other type of ordination, such as priesthood and so on, there's a choice of going through the narrow road. Now, does that have its joy? If you ask St. Mino or St. George, do you regret taking this? Absolutely not. He wouldn't change it one little bit because he saw the joy of being with Christ even through the difficulty. If you ask any of our priests, would you like to sort of resign and like those who were doctors or lawyers or engineers or whatever they were before, you want to take back your, your job and leave the Abuna, would you like to be a lawyer again? <laughs> Um, definitely not. They've chosen to renounce all that. And there were sacrifices for their families, for their careers, whatever else, but for the joy that is set before them, the, the, for the joy that, that fills their lives when they've taken this uh, narrow road, there's no way they would swap it for anything else. So this is an invitation for all of us, for me and for you, to moment by moment choose the narrow road. And it doesn't matter if you choose the broad for a bit. You can always go back. You can always go back to the narrow road. If you see yourself going the wrong way, there's always an opportunity to change. And um, I'll conclude with that. So anybody would like uh, would have a question or comment? <laughs> Want to add something? Can I ask a question? Um, you know how you spoke just then about even if you were choosing the broad, you can you have the opportunity to change. And um, at the start you said the, the main thing is just to recognise that you have the choice. But there, um, the choice between narrow and broad is happening multiple times every single day. How much do we know about... Um, how God reviews those decisions. Like, um, in the end, is it going to be like, on average, they <laughs> took the broad, or is it most recent? Like, you know, my first part of my life was bad, and, and now I've changed my way. Or is it just, like, renewed each time? Like, the last one was not relevant. It's only what's present is concerning to God, or... Is that too I logical love, I way? I love that question. It's a beautiful question. Actually, I'm quite moved by that question because the beauty of our Lord is he doesn't look at averages. See, in other religions, you know, your karma, this, and your 
hasanat and sayyat and you know God is has this scale even the ancient Egyptians you know how they the judgment in ancient Egypt was your heart was put on a scale and a feather on the other and if your heart was lighter than the feather you're in if your heart is heavier than the feather you're out so it depends on all the stuff that you held in your heart whatever right I mean we don't have to, no don't that's not us. That's not God. That's not our Christ. Our Christ on the cross said to the thief on his right, hmm? in a moment when God was revealed to him and he chose him, now today you'll be with me in paradise. That is the beauty of our Lord. It's not about averages. and It's not about how much you know. It's he knows inside the heart. He's not fooled by a word. Like, don't, don't, like some people might think, oh, it's just a magic word the guy said. No, it's not about that. He read his heart, he understood what's in there. Right? I mean, I, the opposite is also true. I could live all my life, shamas and servant, and do this and do that, but I'm empty inside. And, I, you know, I don't have a life with God, it's all show. Is God fooled by that? Absolutely not. You know, he said himself, he said, people will come and say, we raise the dead in your name. And he says, I don't know you. How amazing is that? Because he looks into the heart. You know, he gave the parable of the workers, the ones that worked from the beginning of the day and the ones that just came for an hour. And he gave them the same reward. Why? Because he, he knows why he needs to give these guys that reward and these guys this reward. So it's not about averages. I'm not belittling your question. In fact, it's a beautiful question and an important question because it's a common misconception. It's not about averages. It's not about how many good things you've done, how many poor people you fed, although that's beautiful, of course, if you did. But it's about your heart. It's a, He knows... He, looks right in and right through. Okay? Thanks. When you pass through a gate, like it's narrow when you're passing through the gate, but then it's like the gate's gone and you just kind of continue the path again. Is that right? Or am I pushing the analogy too far? Is it like it's, com- it's short? It's meant to be uncomfortable for a short time, but only a really short time as you're passing through, but then it's not uncomfortable? Well, you can look at it as multiple gates or you can look at it as one gate. I mean, this is just an analogy, right, that Jesus used, right? And the fathers looked into it and gave certain meanings, different meanings, such as the narrow gate is Christ. So every time you choose Christ, you're going through that narrow gate. So you could be going through that narrow gate a million times, right? So, or is it the baptism? So it's obviously once. So it depends, like it's an analogy. There's no... You know, it's not a, a fact, you know. So, um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Hey there, thank you so much for that thank talk. You. That was so um, impactful for me. Yeah. I just have a couple of, well, one question. Um, in regards especially to riches and the comfortable life, um, when it comes to the broad gate, how can we tell um, whether we're really pursuing, you know, the wide gate or the narrow um, when it comes to, say, chasing after that promotion or that extra money or whatever it is Um, because like we know our heart is deceitful and sometimes we can say oh I'm pursuing this so that I can serve God better or so that I can give more money to the poor and that sort of thing so how can we sort of um, keep our heart in check like genuinely and uh, not deceive ourselves or not get confused by that the honest answer is I have no idea. <laughs> but but I won't leave it there because we all have to test the Spirit. You know, we have the Holy Spirit within us, but we have to test the Spirit of whatever we're doing. Is it a spirit of greed? Is it a spirit of um, callousness? Is it a spirit of love? Is it a spirit of wanting to serve God? Like... We really have to test that spirit. How do we test the spirit? 
the Spirit of God that is within us can guide us and we can also get spiritual guidance from our spiritual fathers through prayer, through reading the Bible, through getting spiritual guidance. If we, are, if we have a choice to make, we need to, you know, I, I know someone who, uh, sorry if there's any lawyers here, um, I'm sure there is. There's always lawyers in any Coptic gathering. But um, someone who did law and said, look, you know, I can't be a Christian and do what I'm doing. He was working, by the way, and it's not every lawyer, but of course. He was working for an insurance company. Like he was working for litigation for insurance companies against the common people. So he was constantly trying to get people to, to prove that people are wrong and lying and and so on, so the insurance companies can win. So I just couldn't take that. And so the, he could have kept on going and sort of be the best and most famous lawyer in that field if he wanted to, but he examined his own conscience and he found through the spirit and he found this is not the life he wants to lead. And he took a different path and is very successful in that path. But... You know, it's a it's a thing that you really need to work on. There's no simple answer to that one. That's a very, very important question. The heart is deceitful. I love that what you said. Yeah, the heart is deceitful. And that's from the Bible as well. So we need to, you know, really work on that. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very, very much. Um, that brings our meeting to a conclusion. Uh, we hope that you gained something very spiritual today and something to, to basically carry over into tomorrow and the next day. So a uh, couple of very quick announcements, and I will make them quick. The first of them is, um, just as a reminder, we do start our meetings um, at 8 o'clock. It's preceded by prayer at 7. Uh, Vespers starting from about 7 o'clock with Agveya prayers starting around any time between 7.35, 7.40. Um, and it's really nice if we can all get together and pray um, just before the meeting. And that holds for all of our meetings on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, Wednesday, tomorrow, we have the Bible study. Um, it's led by uh, Buna Shnuti. I think we're still doing the book of the Wisdom of Sirach. Um, which is one of the deuterocanonical books. Yes, I pronounced it Sirach, not Sirach. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful book in the deuterocanonical Bible. So I really recommend uh, enjo uh, joining us for that. The uh, Friday night youth meeting uh, also starts at 8 o'clock. Um, so please feel free to join us if you are free and willing. Um, and that's all of the meetings I can think of. Um, for any information about uh, any of the services times, you can always log on to our uh, website, panagia.stmary.org.au, um, and you can always find out the times or just ask one of the servants or your friends. Um, okay. I think that's just about everything I have. Am I missing anything? No? Yes? No? Cool? All right, let's stand up for prayer. together in love our Lord teaches us when to meet in my name together I will always be in between their gather oh Lord come now and join us here we ask you to come and give us you fill us with joy Spirit and peace, no riches can provide. Oh Lord, come now and join us here. We ask you to come and give us to fill us with joy from your Holy Spirit and peace, no riches can provide. The Lord is here. How lovely he is, how content we are. 
We talk to him and he always listens. He'll always be with us in us. Oh Lord, come now and join us here. We ask you to come and give us cheer. Fill us with the joy from your Holy Spirit. And peace no riches can provide, O oh Lord, come now and join us here. We ask you to come and give us cheer, fill us with joy from your Holy Spirit. And peace no riches can provide. We thank you, our dear Heavenly Father, for the words that we contemplated on today, the narrow gate and the narrow road. May you, Lord, awaken our hearts and minds to the traps and snares of the evil one that he lays before us to attract us to go on the road that leads to perdition. Where you have, Lord, labored and you've, Lord, tasted untold pain to pave the narrow way before us that leads to life. Lord, you created us for life. Help us always choose the road that needs, leads to life. Guide our hearts and minds, Lord, in every decision we make, in every way we walk. We ask you, Lord, for our brothers and sisters who are on the broad, on the, on the broad road that leads to destruction. We ask you for them, Lord. We ask you to bring light to their path that they may see the end of their ways. We ask you, Lord, for those who have fallen astray. We ask you, Lord, for those who are addicted, for those who have depression, for those who have mental health issues. For my brothers and sisters, may you, Lord, touch their lives and change their hearts and change their minds. We ask you, Lord, for those who are sick and those who are suffering. May you, Lord, Carry the cross with them and give them comfort and give them joy. We ask you, Lord, for those who have asked us to pray for them. We ask you, Lord, for every service of the church, every church. May your Lord shine in these services, shine your light in these services, Lord, that others may see it and glorify your holy name. We ask you, Lord, for all the people who work in your field, for Pope Tawadros, for all the bishops, Bishop Daniel, all the bishops, all the priests and all the servants. May you, Lord, strengthen them in your wisdom and strengthen them to keep leading us in the road to life. We thank you, our dear Heavenly Father, for my brothers and sisters who are here. We Ask for those who couldn't make it tonight that you may touch them with your grace. We ask you, Lord, to keep your word alive within us that it may grow and give 30 and 60 and 100 fold. We ask you, Lord, through the intercessions and prayers of our Mother, the Virgin Mary, through the prayers and intercessions of the angels, the archangels, the heavenly hosts, through the prayers of Saint Nina, prayers of Pope Carolus the first, Pope Carolus the sixth, and all the martyrs and saints. May you conclude our prayers. Amen. Through the special blessings, Lord, of the feast of today, we enter into the land of Egypt. We ask you, Lord, to hear us to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, and give us our trespasses against us, and lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Jesus Christ, our Lord, who runs the eternal plan of love. And the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I love God the Father, grace of his only God and Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The gift and communion of the Holy Spirit with you all going peace. May peace all be with you. Thank you so much for here. God bless you.